This is WKDU 91.7 FM, Drexel University's award-winning, student-run, commercial-free, free-format radio. Good morning. You're listening to 1.6 Degrees Centigrade, Rising, and Your Critical Role in Climate Change, Philadelphia's newest public information program on all matters impacted by climate change. This is your author and host, Diane Davis, and this morning we're going to be talking to Miss Tracy Carluccio of Delaware River Keepers Network. But before we uh, start, uh, and I introduce you to um, Miss Carluccio, I wanted to make several announcements um, that are very uh, germane to what we're trying to do here at the program. During the first week of January, uh, Fox Chase Cancer Treatment Center issued an infomercial stating that there would be an additional 1.7 million cases of newly diagnosed cancer during the year 2018. Further, in a recent report prepared by the University of Pittsburgh, with a finding of 650% increase in radiation in the sediment of the Susquehanna, Delaware, uh, Susquehanna River. And this has been accumulating since the beginning of the hydro fracturing drilling process, which is largely unregulated. Uh, and this technology, as, as the listening audience knows, has been referred to as fracking. This is a common term for, for the technology. And this began um, about 10 years ago, and it really got going in 2012, all through the Commonwealth. Um, and so in view of this public health risk uh, information, um, I've asked Tracy Carluccio to be with this um, program and this segment's guest speaker. Ms. Carluccio is the Deputy Director of Delaware River Keeper Network, which is an environmental and clean water activist not-for-profit organization working throughout the Delaware River watershed with offices in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Ms. Carluccio has been employed as an environmental advocate since 1989, working throughout the Delaware River watershed in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, and Delaware. The Delaware River provides drinking water for up to 17 million people, including New York City and Philadelphia. Ms. Carluccio, working with coalitions, serves on steering committees for Pennsylvanians Against Fracking, Green Justice Philly, and the DRBC Frack Ban Campaign. Ms. Carluccio and Delaware River Keepers Network are active in fighting for clean drinking water and healthy communities and in fighting to stop this fracking and the use of dirty fossil fuels. She is seeking instead to develop renewable energy in initiatives to move the nation to energy efficiency and truly clean and sustainable energy sources. Welcome, Tracy, and thank you for your taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us this morning. Thank you, Diane, and thank you very much for inviting us to be here. Uh, Tracy, tell us about your background and what led you to join Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Delaware Riverkeeper Network was formed in 1988, and it really came out of a grassroots effort to protect the Delaware River. Mm -hmm. uh, people wanted to get involved uh, to make sure that the river, which had really been ruined as a result of industrial development, mm -hmm. uh, was brought back to life. And there had been really decades and billions of dollars spent on doing this. And um, when I became involved, it was originally fighting a, a pump project up in Point Pleasant, uh, which would take water away from the Delaware River to mm -hmm. a nuclear power plant and to fuel development in Bucks and Montgomery counties. After that, um, that project, I worked on that for about 10 years, and the community fought that tooth and nail for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the pump was built. Um, but a lot of things came out of that. A, got, a lot of people became very involved and felt that they really had a responsibility and a place in fighting for their communities. Watershed organizations on our tribute 
voluntaries, community groups mm -hmm. committed to mm -hmm. environmental justice, mm -hmm. um, and Delaware Riverkeeper Network. So I was one of the founding members of um, the board that birthed the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and an original staff member. Mm -hmm. um, and I have been working uh, with the fantastic colleagues that I work with at Delaware Riverkeeper Network, including Maya Van Rossum, who is the Delaware Riverkeeper, uh, to protect and defend the Delaware River uh, ever since. Well, the Delaware River is a single source uh, uh, resource for the potable drinking water, bathing water, agricultural water in the um, watershed area. That's right. So it cannot be underestimated. And it is a constitutional right uh, that the people in um, uh, the area, in the watershed area, have clean, potable water. Uh, this is not something that uh, is is a gift. It's it's a uh, it's a um, uh, a right by our constitution. So Tracy, I understand that Delaware Riverkeeper Network uh, has been trying to obtain a ban on the largely unregulated hydro fracturing drilling technology in the Delaware River watershed for the last ten years. Can you speak to this? Yes. Um, back in around 20, 2008, uh, we got calls from upriver in the Delaware River watershed. Um, the top part of the Delaware River watershed in New York and Pennsylvania is underlain by a gas-bearing shale called Marcellus Shale. Mm -hmm. So we started getting calls from people about um, what's called landmen, or people who, who are representing um, gas drillers that want to lease your land uh -huh. uh, in order to be able to extract gas from it. And they were knocking on people's doors and asking them to sign leases mm -hmm. uh, to allow gas drillers to come and, and put in frac, frac wells. Um, people, we, we had never had this in the Delaware River watershed before. We've been working for many years through uh, our programs at Delaware Riverkeeper Network to protect and defend the river. Um, we worked on uh, the, the wild and scenic designation and the special protection waters designation that the Delaware River Basin Commission, the interstate agency that's responsible for water resource management in the Delaware River watershed, had adopted and uh, had been working very um, diligently through all sorts of means uh, to make sure that our river is protected and continued to improve mm -hmm. uh, back from the uh, 1950s and 60s when it basically was a ditch by the time it went past Philadelphia. Sure. And it was very polluted at that time. That's right. And when these gas men started, or landmen started going around and knocking on doors, we got questions like, what is this all about? Mm -hmm. So we started looking into it and we found that in the western part of Pennsylvania, particularly near the border of West Virginia, um, this fracking uh, activity had begun. And fracking, as you mentioned, is high hydraulic fracturing. Um, and it, it shoots um, a large amount of water, uh, chemicals, and a propent, usually sand or silica sand, down hole, about a mile beneath our feet before you get to the Marcellus Shale. Mm -hmm. Then they drill the well bore sideways, mm -hmm. and they, under great pressure, um, put this, uh, this water into the formation mm -hmm. where the gas is and crack it open and let the gas come out. Then the gas and the water shoots back up sort of like a geyser to the surface. Uh -huh. And that's, then they capture that gas and, they, and that's what the drillers want to market. Um, this process is a, a very um, industrial process. It mm -hmm. requires really the transformation of the landscape uh, from what you might have, like in the Upper Delaware, it would be forest and mm -hmm. farms, mm -hmm. uh, to an industrial flattened landscape. Um, and then the drilling of the wells would require um, this injection process called fracking. It would also require Mm, at least 1,400, and depending on how much water and waste is being taken out, up to 2,400 truck trips for each well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about uh, between five and 10, and now the average is actually 10 million gallons to frack each of these wells. Mm -hmm. um, and it also requires that a huge amount of very dangerous p chemicals yeah. are uh, put into gym. the hydraulic right. fracturing uh, fluids and in when they're injected down. Um, so all of this industrial activity was foreign to our, re to our region. Mm -hmm. And when we looked into it and found out it was already occurring, we had to get up to speed fast. Sure. So we, um, we basically sounded an alarm. Um, we started doing our research. Uh, and as we learned more, we w reached out to the communities um, mm -hmm. that were being approached. 
Um, and we worked with other local organizations who were just beginning to form as a re result of this um, threat. And, um, and that was really where the fracking movement, the anti-fracking movement was born in the Delaware River watershed. Mm -hmm. Now the Delaware River watershed is about 13,000 square miles. Mm -hmm. And it uh, has its main stem, the Delaware River, formed by water flows from this watershed. Mm -hmm. And that's in New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Delaware. Mm -hmm. And those areas, pretty much about one third of it is underlain with this Marcellus shale. Mm -hmm. And then there's other shales, actually even all, as far down as Bucks County, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and also in New Jersey and the upper portion of New Jersey that have gas in them too. They're not as um, sought after as the Marcellus shale, but they are gas bearing shale. So we actually have a big potential of, for this threat to become a reality in the Delaware River watershed. Because there had never been any drilling here, there was a lot of questions about how it would be regulated. Mm -hmm. So the Delaware River Basin Commission, after a lot of advocacy and work on the part of the public, instituted a moratorium on gas drilling in our watershed. Oh, so wow. this entire mm -hmm. 13,000 square mile watershed has been under a moratorium for any sort of gas drilling for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, about, about the last 10 years. Um, it was actually eight years, and then now we're, we're moving into the last two years of that. So when the, the moratorium was instituted um, officially, um, there began a study by this Delaware River Basin Commission, the mm -hmm. agency that's mm -hmm. responsible for mm -hmm. water resources management here. And that study uh, resulted in gas, uh, gas drilling uh, regulations mm -hmm. um, very quickly coming out. So we were concerned um, as an environmental organization and a community-based organization that they certainly couldn't have done the, the, the amount of analysis that needed to be done to show that this would be safe. And we really advocated and organized and mm -hmm. worked with many organizations in New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware to make sure that this moratorium was going to remain in place because the Delaware River Basin Commission did issue draft regulations back in 2011. Mm -hmm. And because we knew they hadn't done the proper study uh, and the draft regulations were very weak, uh, we really petitioned the governors of the four states mm -hmm. and the Army Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. who make up the five votes on the Delaware River Basin Commission to keep the moratorium in place and not adopt these regulations. Right. And at the last minute, gosh, Diane, it was about 72 hours before the meeting where they were going to actually vote about whether or not they're going to adopt these regulations. Uh, the governor of Delaware announced that he was not going to support the regulations. And a couple of weeks before, uh, New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation had announced that they were not going to, uh, to accept these regulations because they had begun a process for developing um, Marcellus shale up there and examining that through their own hydraulic fracturing study. Mm -hmm. So the outcome was that the meeting was canceled because that they were not assured, the DRBC was not assured they had the, the majority votes, three of the five votes to sure. actually accept these Quorum. regulations. Uh -huh. So that moratorium went into place and it has held since 2010 when it was put in place. Uh -huh. Now the industry started pushing and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, there has been a huge frenzy of fracking in the rest of Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, communities have been ravaged and the uh, impacts, the legacy pollution, as well as the pollution that's ongoing, mm -hmm. is overwhelming mm -hmm. the environment in mm -hmm. these communities where fracking is concentrated. And so people have been suffering from water supply impacts, um, public health impacts. Um, they've uh, had respiratory problems as well as water pollution problems. And the environment is being transformed. Pennsylvania streams are being ruined. And as a result of all of this activity in the rest of Pennsylvania, um, there really was a, a frenzy. Mm -hmm. Permits were being given out, um, you know, like candy. I understand that to be, to be exactly as you have stated it. And I have heard the exact same testimony from uh, four or five other uh, guest speakers who are also experts in this area, they say the same thing. Um, so um, did you want to finish? I'm, I'm sorry. I... Well, no, that's you're absolutely right. And um, there are a lot of scientific papers and a lot of academic 
studies mm-hmm. that have been issued since 2010 when that moratorium was put in place. As a matter of fact, PSE Healthy Energy, if you Google it, that's, mm-hmm. that's their name, they have um, collected these studies. And there's over a thousand of these studies available now um, on ver- the various uh, impacts mm-hmm. of hydraulic fracturing. Sure. And they uh, have issued um, a compendium through uh, the uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and uh, the Physicians uh, for Healthy Energy in New York, where they have basically curated these reports. Mm-hmm. And most of them show that fracking has negative impacts on the environment. And they talk about the difficulty of controlling or in any way um, mitigating those damages. They're basically intrinsic in the fracking process. Mm-hmm. You really cannot make that process safe. So those scientific studies are very important because a lot has happened since the moratorium was for, put in place. And mm-hmm. we now have the evidence, the overwhelming weight of evidence to show that we need to make this moratorium permanent, permanent. in the Delaware River Basin. We need to make it into a ban. So when the industry started pushing, which was last year, um, as actually was the the end of, of 2016, they started pushing to overturn the moratorium. Sure. We went into high gear. All right. <laughs> and all of the coalition members who had mm-hmm. worked on the original moratorium, even though we had been putting a lot of information on the record of the DRBC over Mm -hmm. the years, um, sharing scientific papers, um, sharing information from the Pennsylvania DEP website themselves, which talk about the negative impacts of fracking on water supplies. we had been doing all this all those years. Now seemed to be the moment since we had all the evidence we needed, and now the industry was trying to overturn the moratorium that we really needed to push to make this a permanent ban. So we started really um, in earnest in January of 2017. Mm-hmm. We have our coalition been at every single DRBC meeting, having a rally, having a press conference mm-hmm. outside, um, standing and speaking before the commissioners, mm-hmm. um, handing in information about why the, the ban should be permanent. As a result of all of this public interest and also the industry pushing to try to overturn this, sure. the Delaware River Basin Commission in September passed a resolution that said that they were going to issue natural gas regulations, draft natural gas regulations, and in it would be, number one, a complete ban on fracking, high volume hydraulic fracturing throughout the Delaware River watershed. Mm -hmm. But illogically and inexplicably, they also said they were issuing draft regulations that would allow wastewater produced by fracking outside of the basin to be brought here, stored here, processed here, and discharged into the Delaware River watershed. Now that makes absolutely no No sense. sense. How could you possibly say that fracking is so dangerous you're gonna ban it, and yet you're gonna allow one of the most toxic components of fracking, the discharge of highly toxic and radioactive wastewater to be discharged here. They also put into these draft regulations that water could be removed from the Delaware River watershed and taken out of the basin to fuel fracking elsewhere. Oh my God. Now we are totally opposed to fracking anywhere. Right. We certainly don't want to be the watershed that provides water for other communities to be ruined by fracking. Right. And we also don't want our water depleted. We need that for the people who drink that water every single day. As you said at the top of the show, Diane, 17 million people, millions of people every single day, including Philadelphia, exactly. drink water from the Delaware River watershed. And it's very good water. Mm-hmm. Um, we have fought, there's blood on the walls in the <laughs> Delaware River watershed for people who have fought for decades, really a hundred years to bring this watershed back. And we're not gonna let it go. That water is exceptional quality. It's part of the wild and scenic Delaware River. It can't be degraded by regulation that's mm-hmm. been adopted by exactly. the Delaware River Basin Commission. And you also mentioned and constitutional rights. Um, We have a right to clean water here in Pennsylvania. Um, I came across something in my my research. It's called the the Constitution uh, actually uh, goes further in that if a a natural uh, water uh, like this, the watershed, is uh, the single source for potable bathing, agriculture, and um, grazing water, that it can it, it, it falls automatically um, 
into that, you know, protected status. Uh, I am going to be posting that link. Um, I do have it in my research. I wanted to um, talk mm. with you first because I know you're going to give our listening audience at the end of the program uh, some additional links with all these wonderful reports in them. And I cannot encourage our listening audience enough to go to my website, download these, go to the links, and read for yourself. Um, we all need to be well-informed citizen voters, and this goes back to the elections that will be coming up in our uh, Pennsylvania uh, state legislature, and it goes to the uh, previous um, uh, broadcast that we had um, given to us by uh, Representative Greg Vitale. Um, and he prepared this Marcella Shale uh, report that actually outlined uh, the corruption of our, of our legislators who are not acting in the interests of their constituents uh, who they have taken oaths to uphold and protect. Rather, they are preventing uh, any kind of restrictive reg regulation from coming to the floor for even voting on it uh, because they're paid off. Um, so uh, I just wanted to insert that, that uh, at the end, uh, I'll be giving some of these links to our listening audience. Well, um, Tracy, I understand that as uh, advocacy staff, you take part in and you encourage others to take part in the decision-making uh, process that affects the environment and communities of the watershed and the four states um, that are part of the watershed. And you've just mentioned some of these um, activities. Could you tell us about your own experience with attending the public hearings uh, being conducted regarding this uh, very dangerous um, and uh, largely, as we have said, unregulated technology and its attendant public health risk issues. What happens during these hearings? Well, these hearings are um, held by the Delaware River Basin Commission, and they have a hearing officer that runs them. Um, as I mentioned, um, in the fall, the DRBC uh, adopted a resolution that they would issue these regulations and the proposed ban. Mm -hmm. So in, um, on November 30th, they did that. And when they issued the draft regulations, which include this, the, the proposed ban, but not a complete ban like we want, mm -hmm. um, they set up hearings. And a, uh, and a written comment period. So the hearings were set up for January. There were two days of them, uh, Philadelphia uh, at the airport, um, at one of the, at the Hilton down there, mm -hmm. uh, had two hearings in one day. And um, there was also uh, another set of hearings in Wayne County mm -hmm. uh, in Pennsylvania in the upper part of the basin. They had two hearings in one day. Um, we, uh, as a, a community, all of our organizations uh, did not feel this was adequate. And we um, had a huge campaign, letter writing campaign and uh, r r rallies and everything to try to get a more open and inclusive and extensive public comment process. Because originally they, uh, also had a written comment period that was going to end on February 28th, today. Mm -hmm. And that was simply not enough time for people to be able to delve into these issues sure. and then weigh in uh, in a fair way through these a public are comment These complicated issues. Yeah. They are. And they really, it requires people to think. And it, it really, if you do things too quickly and you don't give the people enough opportunity to participate through various means, mm -hmm. then you're really... Um, uh, acting unjustly. And we felt the DRBC was being unjust. They were cutting people out from participating. We still do not feel that the process is inclusive or fair, but they did add um, two uh, more hearings and they added a, uh, and one of them is a telephone hearing, which is gonna be happening, the last one where you can verbally testify on March 6th. And I'll be giving you the link to that because if you wanna speak on that telephone hearing, mm -hmm. you have to sign up ahead of time. But we really encourage your listeners to sign up for that. We'll have a link to a, a Facebook page um, that we've created that goes right to the DRBC where you sign up. Mm -hmm. And we also have talking points to help people you know, get up to speed on what the nat natural gas regulations actually say, mm -hmm. as well as why we need to have a permanent ban and a complete ban that also bans the wastewater uh, discharge that they're proposing and the water export that they're proposing. So we want 
them to ban it all. And this is what people have been going to these hearings saying. There has been an outpouring of public support for the position that we, as a coalition to ban fracking in mm -hmm. the Delaware River watershed, have supported, which is to ban completely mm -hmm. the, ban the fracking process. And that means ban hydraulic fracturing throughout every inch of the Delaware River watershed. It also means ban the processing and storage and discharge of this highly toxic frack wastewater. Any wastewater or produced water from fracking, ban it from being discharged here altogether. No matter where it comes from, it should not be discharged here. Sure. And then also ban the export and the use of the Delaware River's precious freshwater resources sure. for fracking. Once that water is used, it's ruined. First of all, Absolutely. most of it stays underground because the fracking process, about 90% of it on average in the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. stays underground. So right. it's not like it's available to the hydrologic cycle to go back up and you know come back down as rain. It's locked away and for a long time. It has become irradiated uh, by virtue of the fact that, I, I said this before, and this is where the radiation is coming from. Once you release that shale and you, you, you burst um, the shale, to get at the small pools of uh, natural gas, you release naturally radioactive uh, elements, me metallic elements that have been in the ground for billions of years since the um, formation of uh, planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And these are highly radioactive. They go on in on uh, for thousands of years uh, in decay process and. Uh, this is not something that we can uh, bottle and uh, you know store somewhere. It it goes it goes on uh, for thousands of years. So well, yeah, that's a really good point, Diane, about it going on for thousands of years because you know not the water goes away mm -hmm. and it's locked away. The part that comes back up, as you said, is polluted not only with the fracking chemicals that sure. they use, and they are carcinogen, and many of them are carcinogenic. They have health pro you know they cause health problems. Um, if not cancer, other health problems. Childhood leukemia. Endocrine disruptors. There's a lot of uh, very um, serious health problems associated with the chemicals that they use, but they also contain what you described, these naturally occurring radioactive materials. And one of them is radium-226, which has a half-life of 1,600 years. So what are you going to do with a half-life of 1,600 years in your waste? You're not going to be able to handle that. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, the expert that we have engaged to look at this issue of radioactivity um, and to help us with our comments that we'll be filing with the Delaware River Basin Commission by the way, March 30th is the deadline for those comments. We did get that change from February 28th to March 30th. But the, he, uh, that radi radiation expert says that basically you can precipitate it out from the wastewater, but then you're left with a radioactive sludge. Yes, And exactly. the only way to handle that sludge is to handle it like nuclear waste from a, exactly. a bomb or a, or a power plant. And it and so that means putting it, taking it to some special you know uh, facility where it's supposed to be segregated from the environment for thousands, thousands of thousands years. Thousands of years. So this is a problem. It, you know, this radiation, these naturally occurring radio, radio active materials, and then also the heavy metals, the benzene, toluene, um, uh, xylene, and, and, and all of the, the BTEX chemicals, also um, heavy he other sorts of heavy metals, all of these materials that come back up, mm -hmm. they all have to be dealt with. Sure. And we don't have any federal gu guidelines to tell us how to do that. The regulations that have been put forward in, these dr in this draft from the Delaware River Basin Commission do not make the wastewater treatment effective. There's absolutely, according to our experts who have advised us, there's absolutely no way that you can remove all of the chemicals that are in absolutely. this waste. They're very high in salts. They have actually turned freshwater streams to saltwater streams right, in, yeah. in Pennsylvania, right. killing fish by the hundreds, killing everything with gills. Uh, by the by the, the thousands, hundreds of species. It has also turned, as you mentioned, uh, rivers in Pennsylvania downstream of, of wastewater facilities that are supposed to be treating this frac waste into uh, radioactive stream beds. We actually have a 200 times the background level for radiation below a wastewater treatment facility in Pennsylvania discovered by Duke University when they did sediment testing. Mm -hmm. And they went back years later and did it again, and it's not gone away. So so we have radioactive materials that escape, and the ones that don't are in this highly toxic radioactive sludge. These 
materials and the water that then is ruined because it's so polluted you can't make it drinkable again are yes. perversions of water management. And we can't imagine how the Delaware River Basin Commission could seriously put forward this proposal to allow that wastewater to come into the watershed and then to ruin the water we have by having it polluted or locked away. Um, you know, I wanted to also mention, you talked about constitutional rights, Diane, and I think it's a really important point I'd like to amplify from what you said. The Pennsylvania Constitution has what's called an Environmental Rights Amendment, Article 1, Section 27. And I'll send you the link to that. But I actually have the wording of it here, and it's very short. But Please. I would like to read it to you. It's only three sentences, and it will stir you. Um, the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including generations yet to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all people. Now, this was written early in the 1970s. It was adopted in a perfect storm of time um, uh, by a, a leg being proposed by a, le a legislator at the time, Franklin Curry. And it really hasn't meant a lot over the years in terms of law until the Delaware River Basin Commission um, uh, began, um, I mean, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network um, challenged a act that was a far, a very greedy act put th uh, forward by the Pennsylvania legislature to allow fracking in every inch of the watershed of the uh, Pennsylvania. And as a result of this Act 13, um, these municipalities and a doctor and Delaware Riverkeeper Network appealed this and went all the way to the Supreme Court and won based on Article 1, Section 27. Exactly. So we are continuing to make this meaningful by um, moving through the legal process, challenges to what we feel are transgressions of Article 1, Section 27, particularly through fracking. And we believe we will eventually prevail and prove that fracking is cannot possibly be compatible with the Envi Environmental Rights Amendment in Pennsylvania. But as far as the Delaware River Basin Commission is concerned, I think it's very clear that Pennsylvania's governor, Governor Wolf, has to consider Article 1, Section 27. He took an oath to uphold the Constitution and all of its articles. And states' rights cannot go, they cannot write out uh, what we are guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, that, is our, that is our right as citizen voters. Um, this is really great. Uh, I will be posting the link um, that Tracy will give me. Well, uh, Tracy, can you tell me about how many people are aware of the fracking and um, the, and, and this de this great debate that's going on, uh, and and how much interest there is uh, in the um, on this issue in in the the general area. Well, not enough people know about this. Um, now, we did, over the last year, as I said, work to raise awareness of this. And we did file 65,000 petitions with the Delaware River Basin Commission mm. during the summer, mm -hmm. which was one of the things that helped get the uh, proposed ban uh, uh, pr uh, proposed by the Delaware River Basin Commission. Um, and also, um, you know, more people in the different states know about it now than they did before. And, if, and more people know about fracking than they did when we first started this 10 sure, years ago. Sure. Uh, most people have heard the word fracking. They, ha they have an idea that it has something to do with chemicals being shot into the ground right. in order to release gas. So um, we need more people, however, to know about the opportunity to weigh in with the Delaware River Basin Commission to say we want a complete ban. Mm -hmm. We want a ban on hydraulic fracturing. We want a ban on wastewater being discharged, stored, or processed here. And we want a ban on water being exported for fracking or used for fracking in any way. And I think, you know, we are gaining ground in terms of people learning about this because hundreds of people did come out to the hearings. Um, but And there's a public uh, comment period open, as I mentioned, to March 30th. Mm -hmm. And I'm sending you links because it would be really great if your listeners could take a few minutes and click on the link 
that we provide to a comment platform. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is made it really, uh, you can do it very quickly if you want, very easy to comment. And what the DRBC set up is actually a convoluted process, but mm -hmm. you can look at some talking points on different issues and you can pick them out, put them into a template and send it right to the DRBC. It That's really great. only takes a few minutes. That's great. If you want to do more, Diane, there's background information. And you can go and you can look at sort of the information that you're so interested in, you know, the scientific papers right. and the citations to various academic studies and uh, health studies that are now coming out. Um, reflecting what the problems are with, with public health impacts in Pennsylvania that are really emerging in fracked areas. So all of this information um, is provided each week and you can take that information and write up a more personal letter, which we encourage people to do if they can. But each week, every Wednesday, we put a new issue out with new talking points. Mm -hmm. So I, if you look up, up on Google, just type in eight weeks to a ban. It'll pop up and you'll see today's, the fresh uh, issues that are being put forward and the suggested bullet points will be right there. Mm -hmm. And all the ones for the weeks before will be there as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Watershed Wednesdays, that's the other w platform that we've put together. Mm -hmm. And that is similar. It has a Google form. You pick out your bullets or you can do a more in-depth uh, comment if you want based on the supplemental background information. So these comment platforms are meant to help people get their comments in because the Delaware River Basin Commission is only accepting comments through their portal. So we've connected ours with theirs. Oh, wonderful. And it and, and makes it easier because your talking points are right there. Okay, so it's, it's end user friendly. It's end user friendly. And um, you know, we really, the last time when they had natural gas regulations in 2011, you were able to send in emails. They're not even accepting emails. You have to use that portal. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes it difficult. And some people don't have access to email, but they're not accepting hard mail. They're not even accepting U.S. Postal Service mail. You can hand in a hard copy. So people who want to do a hard copy, a regular handwritten copy, they're get, sending them to us at Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and we're scanning them and putting them into the Delaware River Basin Commission system, because we feel it's the right of everybody to speak on this issue. This is a moment in time where we'll be able to put in place permanent protection. And if we don't get this complete ban, we will be losing our water supplies. We'll be losing the Wild and Scenic River. And all of the really important economic drivers that we experience and benefit from because mm -hmm. we have healthy fisheries and because we have um, a you know recreational use in the sure. upriver and because we have a beautiful river next to where people live, all of these these economic drivers that really are fundamental to the economic stability of the Delaware River watershed are being threatened here by this fracking. And once we get this in place, and we believe we will, um, but it's not a given, um, then, then we'll be able to be, as people, in a better position to protect not only our health mm -hmm. and our watershed's health and the critters that, leave he that live here, sure. but also future generations. We feel it's essential that we do this. Well, it's not only the fishing industry, but I understand that uh, hunting of deer uh, is, is a huge sport throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, it's not something I've ever engaged in, but uh, I understand from Representative Vitale that they closed down the legislature uh, so that at the opening season of the hunting, uh, and of course you have the deer who are drinking from these uh, polluted, contaminated uh, water streams. And then, of course, uh, the meat is being fed to their families. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, the wastewater, the whole fracking process should be uh, recategorized as a um, nuclear uh, waste industry. And then that would automatically bring much more sophisticated regulations into it. Right, and the Delaware River Basin Commission as a as a interstate agency is actually a federal agency and they have the power to do just what the you The NRC, said. the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, has the power to do that. Uh, that's what they're entrusted with, uh, nuclear waste. We have uh, other agencies uh, that are also set up to deal with nuclear waste and that's exactly what we're describing here. 
And uh, the Delaware River Basin Commission, um, because they're responsible for the water supply for 17 million people, and because they exist under a compact that was set up by the Supreme, uh, Supreme Court decree uh, many decades ago, um, has the power to set their own regulations that apply to all the lands within the watershed. And there's only a very few watershed um, uh, compacts that exist in the United States. Um, this was actually signed into law by uh, President Kennedy mm -hmm. um, in, in, 19, in the 1960s. Right. And as a result of that, we are, actually have benefited greatly because it allowed the river to be cleaned up and then it allowed the river to be designated as special protection waters mm -hmm. under these DRBC regulations, which says that you cannot degrade exceptional water quality when you have it and you must bring that water quality up to standards where you don't have it. And here in the Delaware River watershed, we benefit in Philadelphia with good drinking water because we have this fresh clean water sure. coming from upstream sure. to dilute all of the inputs of pollution on the way down. If we mess that up and that's where the shale is, um, then we're gonna be ruining our water supply. The other thing I'd like to mention, Diane, is if the wastewater comes here, it's most likely going to target, the industry is most likely going to target this region because the wastewater is far too salty. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of salts in it. And you really cannot remove those salts um, completely. So in order to be able to have a surface water discharge of this wastewater, they really would have to go to a very salty area. Yeah. So we're very concerned that the estuary and bay, which is basically from this region of the river, Philadelphia, right. southern, southern New Jersey, you know, all the way not of the Tidal River, all the way down to the ocean, this area is going to be targeted by industry to dump wastewater here. And it's even unconscionable. Though, it's just yeah, absolutely it, it, unconscionable. And that will affect all of us. I mean, there are even air impacts that come from that, from yeah. the volatilization yes, of chemicals exactly. that are in the, the waste. The and natural biosphere, uh, evaporation, condensation back down into the water. Uh, yeah. It's unconscionable. Right. Uh, so the big energy companies in the gas and oil industry want to be able to control what happens in the watershed. Um, they want to frack for gas, dump wastewater, and, and take water out of our potable drinking sources for fracking to serve their own needs, despite the constitutional rights of the people who live here. Um, this could, as you've already mentioned, uh, seriously, and it probably already has begun, um, due to the un unregulation, the, the non regulate related uh, drilling process already in danger. Many uh, children who probably were born and, and uh, gestated during this last eight-year period, um, we don't know what the results are going to be until they're over 21 uh, and, the gro and the growth process has, um, has been completed uh, with the brain maturation. And this not only affects uh, the embryos, but the young children and, and senior citizens as well, because I understand that the, uh, the landowners are very much uh, senior citizens um, upstate where, where a lot of this uh, fracturing is going on. Well, there's, yeah, there's, there's, of course, senior citizens. There's also, um, you know, various age groups. And in terms of developmental impacts like you're talking about, which some of the chemicals that are used in fracking have developmental impacts, sure. our most vulnerable populations are children. Sure, of course. And there have been studies um, done in Pennsylvania that show that you really cannot be close you can be as close as two miles to a well site and still be impacted by uh, ad adverse impacts from air pollution from a well. Evaporation. Yeah, so you have air, your downwind of these wells and the uh, pipelines and compressor stations that come along with the wells, all of the infrastructure build out that is pushed by these wells, um, and all of that affects public health. Um, and it also, there are studies that have shown that, that uh, fetuses and infants um, within um, 
proximity of mm -hmm. the of uh, fracked wells and compressor stations um, ha suffer negative health impacts uh, at a greater rate than those who are not that close. So we know from the studies that are being done that um, people are suffering at a disproportionate rate depending on how close they are to fracked areas. And that's not just, that's wrong. And this, but this information, as you said, takes time to come out. And really, in order for that data to be collected and then mm -hmm. analyzed and mm -hmm. shown, um, you have to have a will to do that. For many years, Pennsylvania wasn't, the Department of Health wasn't even collecting that data. There wasn't even a health registry to look at these issues. Mm -hmm. And there is work going on now, mainly by um, private institutions um, and the Southwest Environmental Health Project, uh, Greisinger Health Center, to put together some of this basic, important health impact data around fracked areas. So we're, we're really just learning about this. Um, in Texas, where they fracked for longer, um, they found benzene in people's blood who, lives, who live close to these wells. Benzene is a carcinogen. We know that. It's proven by the Environmental Protection Agency. And you mentioned non-regulation. And you know the, the argument that you would get back from pro-drillers is that, well, that's what the DRBC is going to do. They're going to regulate it. They're going to do the best they can. We know even with regulation, it can't be made safe. Because because sure. intrinsically, using these toxic chemicals, which they must use in order to be able to get the gas out and control the process, right. um, they're releasing uh, dangerous uh, chemicals that have health effects into the environment. And then because they're going down into that deep formation where the pollutants are that you and I talked about, you're bringing those back up and there's no way not to do that. The other thing that's, I think, very important is that people realize that Fracking was really given um, an unfair advantage over a lot of other industrial mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. back uh, to, in the 2000s. The Energy Policy Act was passed in 2005, and there were also other acts that were passed, but pr pretty much every major federal environmental law has an exemption for oil and gas development. And how could that possibly be fair or acceptable? Uh, we have tried over the years to get federal government to undo some of these. It is slow going. And we've decided that the best way to try to fight it is to fight it where we live. That's one of the reasons we're engaged here in the watershed. We also, and uh, as you mentioned, we serve on the Pennsylvanians Against Fracking um, steering committee. Mm -hmm. We want to see a, a fracking stop throughout Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that that, you know, to most people sounds outlandish, but we think if we're ever going to meet the clean energy goals mm -hmm. that the governor and others are putting forward is what Pennsylvania wants to do, we have to stop fracking because the methane that's released into the atmosphere Surely. as a result of fracking and the infrastructure of Surely. fracking uh, is 86 times more powerful than carbon in trapping heat. So that means we've got this very powerful greenhouse gas that is slipping between the cracks because it's not counted by the EPA when they do their carbon counting. Mm -hmm. It's going into the atmosphere, nevertheless, and institutions such as the Smithsonian and others are now beginning to release reports. Um, there have been fantastic reports put out by Cornell University, Tony and Graffia, Bob Harworth, talking about the methane being the culprit that is going to keep us from meeting our carbon reduction goals. And just what your very show here talks about, mm -hmm. meeting those goals of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere so we can actually survive as a planet. And I think that that is an important uh, fact for people to understand. They think natural gas is cleaner because it burns cleaner at the fl at the flame. It does release less carbon when it's burned, but it's the process cradle to grave from extraction to moving it through the pipelines, mm -hmm. through the compressor stations, and then to the end use where we have the problem. Pennsylvania... And the leaking. The and, leaking and it leaks. all along that. And Pennsylvania has put forward uh, through the permitting of 49 new natural gas power plants in Pennsylvania, the specter of Pennsylvania actually becoming 
more of a problem than it is even now because more natural gas will, and methane will be released to the atmosphere as it leaks from these facilities. We cannot build new natural gas power plants. We can't build processing facilities to make more plastic uh, without releasing this methane and other pollutants into the environment. So there's a lot of arguments related to climate as well as water pollution and air pollution um, connected with the fracking process. Well, I, you know, I just find it absolutely astonishing that the, uh, the oil and gas industry believes that they have a right to destroy uh, everything that is uh, wholesome and good about this planet. And they are, and it is 100% human activity. And they've got Congress sewn up uh, with all of their lobbying uh, money. Um, I, I wrote about that in my first uh, volume of my series, Fusion Energy and the, uh, the Public's Guide. I went into that uh, quite a lot in detail. And Representative Vitale, uh, several weeks ago on our broadcast uh, program, said that the only way to change this uh, is to vote them out of office, find out who these representatives are in, in you know, the bicameral um, houses and get rid of them, just vote them out. Uh, in that regard, we do have, we still do have the upper hand, but um, it's a tough road and everybody has to get involved. This, this is a democracy of the people, by the people, for the people. And as a self-directed, self-governed uh, uh, govern, government, we must all stay involved, get involved, and uh, hold our representatives accountable. Well, um, I take it that you have had many conversations with medical staff personnel and of concerned uh, citizen organizations um, uh, such as these health professionals. And uh, Tracy, would you give me the links to some of these uh, organizations so that I can post them? It will be posted on my uh, links website under Tracy Carluccio's name and today's broad or uh, mon uh, Monday. March 5th broadcast. Um, how can people weigh in with their op opinions? Is there any other way besides, um, what do you think about writing to Congress? I mean, this is a state issue that we're working on right now, but it goes above that. It really goes to the corruption in our, um, in our federal system uh, that mm -hmm. Uh, tighter regulations were not written at the federal level. This this is where um, uh, we should be targeting as well. Um, uh, what do you think about that? I mean, do you have anything set up? Uh, is there any environmental group who in in the watershed area that may have information on that that we could post as a link? Sure. Well, um, definitely fracking um, is a national problem mm -hmm. because there are 38 gas producing states now and all, they all use fracking now in order to get the gas out and the oil as well. Um, even in Texas, where they traditionally have, you know, the old fashioned oil wells, they're fracking for oil now because um, they're down in there trying to get every little bit out of the rock. Well, that's it. Every and last drop. That's right. Every last drop. And they're doing the same like they're doing with gas they're doing for oil. And um, so we do believe that um, it's time for the nation um, to move away from fossil fuels. Um, oil and gas, they're dirty. Uh, they pollute and they also cause climate change. So in order for us to really move away from that, we have to develop renewables, and we're working on that at Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And organizations that we work with, such as the Sierra Clubs in each of the states, mm -hmm. and um, the, the various other organizations um, in New York, Catskill Mountain Keeper, we work with Burke's Gas Truth in Pennsylvania, um, uh, Damascus Citizens for Sustainability and the upper part of Pennsylvania's watershed in Wayne County. We work with Clean Water Action in New Jersey and Environment New Jersey. Um, all of these, and then many, many, many other organizations 
um, at, at grassroots and state levels. And uh, everybody is, is realizing that we think that there is a, a sea change happening. And it's really happening because the climate is um, change so that are occurring are becoming so bad. And we know that uh, climate changes affect water resources. Mm -hmm. They cause flooding. Mm -hmm. um, they cause sea level rise. Mm -hmm. uh, they and they they cause unstable weather conditions that then lead to the erosion and, and sedimentation and destruction of our stream systems as well as our rivers. So we have a lot of water resource impacts from climate change, and they go on and on, and we're discovering them as they pop up, sure. and communities have to deal with them. On top of that, we have all kinds of changes to our natural ecosystems Surely. as a result of climate change. The habitats change. are being eroded. And species as a result of habitats are being negatively impacted. Sure. And uh, forests are coming under attack. We're having a lot of, you know, of natural vegetation is being overrun by invasives that couldn't live in colder areas and now they're taking over. So we have a whole onslaught of our natural systems as well as our water quality as a result of, of climate changes. And I think this is moving groups to become involved in the way that you say it is to get more involved like through Green Justice Philly which is a coalition in, in Philadelphia here Philadelphia based organizations working to try to get the city of Philadelphia um, to become 100% renewable the goal is by 2030 and to to generate that electricity locally in Philadelphia and the five county region we want we actually want 30 percent of the electricity uh, that's used by Philadelphia to be generated locally to give local jobs good local jobs sure, to people sure. build wealth in neighborhoods Surely. and and make sure that the city of Philadelphia's uh, buildings and infrastructure is being utilized to actually produce solar through rooftop solar and these this is being done in other cities as well so we are not getting what we need from the federal government we're not getting what we need from our legislators in Washington so while we continue to work there and we are working on changes at that level mm -hmm. we're taking action at the local level too so we're doing that in Philadelphia through Green Justice Philly and other efforts we're doing that in the Delaware River watershed through our, our ban campaign we're doing that in Pennsylvania through Pennsylvania's against fracking and then there coalitions and groups from all the way down to the grassroots community park level mm -hmm. that are working on this and yes we think that it is important to weigh in at the federal level mm -hmm. level as far as the Delaware River Basin Commission ban is concerned there's only five votes mm -hmm. those five votes are the governors of the four states New York New Jersey Pennsylvania and, and, and Delaware, Delaware and the Army Corps of Engineers which represents the Trump administration. We do not expect the Army Corps of Engineers to support the ban on fracking. As a matter of fact, they voted against even putting it out there for public comment. Oh, wow. But we believe that the governors of the four states will listen to the people. They will read the scientific evidence that were that is being put onto the record, that the case that the public is making through the written comments to the Delaware River Basin Commission will be listened to, and those votes will vote for a complete ban on wastewater and water withdrawals, as well as banning fracking in the watershed. And that is really what we need to concentrate on now between now and March 30th. Those um, after March 30th, it will take them months before they decide. And we will continue as a campaign to um, have various rallies and events and public awareness mm -hmm. uh, raising efforts. Um, we'll have you know events in the various states. We'll have watershed-based events. And we'll continue to participate in our national efforts to try to ban fracking and replace fracking with healthy, clean, sustainable energy. Um, energy that's renewable from the sun, from the wind, um, not uh, dependent on dirty fossil fuels and extraction in order to produce the, our energy sources. You know, the, the big fallacy is that people believe that we need because they are not familiar with the technology and the actual scientific facts of the, the, the technologies. We don't need fossil fuels anymore. No, we, we don't. We have technologies that uh, could completely uh, rule them out but it's this, um, it's at the federal level that we have this um, large influence of uh, corrupting money in Congress. Uh, and again, there, there are many authors uh, who have written about this. It's not only myself in my series. <clears throat> uh, so 
Tracy, what I would like to do is, uh, after this period, um, I would like to have you back uh, for our next uh, group of uh, broadcasts, and I'd like to discuss more with you what we can do at the federal level. Um, we will be having uh, elections again shortly, not only in the state, but at the federal level, um, you know, the, uh, the interim. Uh, and we need to start looking at the candidates who are progressive, uh, pro-environmental science and public health protective, uh, that they are above taking these uh, lobbying monies from the, um, from the big oil and gas uh, companies. You know, one way to, uh, just as an aside, uh, market uh, economics dictate that they couldn't survive, that the oil and gas couldn't survive very long if we, the end users, the consumers, just didn't use their products anymore. So, uh, you know, we have a thing that they don't, and that is numbers. Uh, 321 million Americans, you know, uh, we could literally uh, wipe them off the market by just not using any of their products. Um, there are technologies like uh, the, the printing and dye industry that will always need, unless we go on to something uh, much better, uh, a greener uh, set of dyes that do require petrochemicals that are derived from oil. Um, uh, so. We do have an opportunity to, but we have to start with education. We must start educating and getting 321 million people really on board with this thing. And the only way we can do that is through education. Um, so I'd like to have you back uh, after the, uh, the comment period, and we'll mm -hmm. talk about this more, at, uh, about what we can do at the national level. For now, and my uh, listening audience, I, I just want you to know that um, I'm going to be posting a very long list of these reports and the links that um, Tracy is going to give me. And I, I cannot ask you, uh, I urgently ask you to uh, download the information, get involved. This is your country. Once the natural resources have become irradiated, it's thousands of years before the decay process is over with. That is, you know, 500 generations at least. Uh, we need all to get involved in this. Um, it's not just an immediate problem. This is for many, many thousands of years um, in, in trying to deal with this radioactive waste. Well, Tracy, it's been such a delight and so informative to have you here. I, we really do appreciate your coming uh, and taking time out of your very busy. I know you're meeting with people who are giving uh, testimony. Uh, you're, you're going to these hearings day and you're meeting with people nights and weekends. It's a 24 hour process uh, with you. And um, there are many dedicated Americans, but we have to get uh, we have to get the general uh, citizen voter on board with this. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add at this point? I would just add that I think it is absolutely essential that everybody who drinks water weigh in with the Delaware River Basin Commission. Oh, that's three hundred. <laughs> that's all of us. And and we have so many. Um, uh, people who are really not aware of where their water comes from. Exactly. But if you live in the Delaware River watershed, you drink the water. But if you live in New York or Philadelphia or outside of the watershed, water is already exported to you. There are 9 million people who live in New York City that drink Delaware River water on any given day. So th it's there's really... Um, and a, a thirst out there that everybody has <laughs> as human beings. Great fun. <laughs> and, and so we need to have everybody who wants to protect the water that quenches their thirst to weigh in with the Delaware River, River Basin Commission on these proposed 
uh, ban and wastewater and water draft regulations. And you can do that through the links that I'm going to be giving to you. It only takes a few minutes, but it's vitally important. And you'll be protecting with those few minutes years and generations to come. So it's a very impactful thing to do. Um, and we really ask that people take a few minutes to do that. We're hoping that your listeners and students um, we, you know, we'll be moved to say, hey, I can do this one thing and yeah. I'm, I'm going to have a long lasting impact if I do it. So that's what we really want people to do, to get to get, you know, on the, the uh, computer um, and weigh in. You can even do that phone conference, which we'll have a link to on March 6th. It's from 1.30 to 3.30 in the afternoon. You okay. call in and you can speak up there if you don't have time to write. So we really um, appreciate being here, Diane, because it's this kind of exposure to people who maybe didn't know about this before mm -hmm. that counts for us, because every new person we reach is a new person who may actually weigh in. Public information based on the, uh, the scientific facts, that's what w the, the, the purpose of this program is. Um, thank you very much, Tracy, for being with us today. Uh, I just want to make uh, a couple of notes to my listening audience. Um, as I said before, uh, the links will be posted on my website, and that is www.institutefuseenedtech.org. You click on the name of the radio program, 1.6 degree centigrade, rising and your critical role in climate change, and you will find all of the broadcasts and all of the links to all of my um, guest speakers, but in particular uh, here where you can become uh, very interactive and do some good for not only your children, but generations to come. Uh, I'll be posting them just uh, in the next couple of days uh, on my website. And I encourage everybody to get involved in uh, democracy because uh, it's a democracy, uh, self-driven, self-governed, and it's of the people, by the people, for the people. And that means that all 321 million of us need to stay involved and uh, stay very much um, uh, on top of what our elected officials are doing, both in Washington and our state legislatures, respectively. Um, I just wanted to make one uh, short announcement. Uh, we will be finishing this quarter's um, series of broadcasts in uh, three weeks. Uh, we are going to run the series over again while I am uh, having time. Well, I, that will give me time to prepare the next quarter of um, broadcasts for our listening audience. Uh, and in addition, uh, I'll be posting podcasts um, uh, as, as soon as I can get to it. Thank you for listening, and um, thank you for joining us at WKDU 91.7 FM uh, for another very informative segment on all matters impacted by climate change. This is your author and host, Diane Davis. <laughs>